Okay, we're back again for episode four of our Vehicle Dynamics Insight series. Back again with Mike Claw. So we're going to start today with talking about Ackermann geometry. And Ackermann geometry is to do with the, the steered wheels of a vehicle. And uh, it, it basically is around the relationship between the inside and the outside wheel of a turn, how the steer angle of those wheels changes with uh, steering input. So Mike, why don't you introduce some of your ideas about the topic and we'll go from there. No, thank you very much. So I think as you describe, when we say Ackerman, we're talking about the, the relative gain of toe angle on the inside and the outside wheels as you add steer into the car. Uh, and we can talk about three uh, main modes of being, let's say. We've got the case where both wheels are gaining steer at the same rate. Uh, we call that parallel Ackerman. Uh, there's the situation where we're getting more steer on the inside wheel. Uh, we'll call that pro Ackerman. And finally, the situation where you've got more steer on the outside wheel, and we'll call that anti Ackerman. Uh, and as a vehicle dynamicist, vehicle dynamicist or a suspension design engineer, you can attach percentage values to this, depending on the, the sort of absolute values of these, these relative rates. Uh, but again, those rates might not be completely constant with steer. It kind of depends on how you've got your geometry set up. So uh, you can often kind of take a fixed value of steer uh, that you're, you say you're going to calculate your Ackerman percentage at uh, and use that uh, through all of your design process. And, and when we're kind of talking about the design process, we're mainly talking about varying the the angle of the steering arm relative to the longitudinal axis of the car uh, and as a way of controlling this value. But if your steering system is, is completely designed uh, and the car is, is already running, you can think of uh, the car's toe angle on the front axle as being a bit like a, a, a static Ackerman uh, that you can use to tune the uh, relative angle of, angles of the inside and outside tires uh, for say a certain point around the lap. So whether you want um, pro Ackerman or anti Ackerman is very much dependent on the application you, you're focusing on. And this is where it starts to get interesting with tire dynamics. So in racing, it's usually convention to use anti Ackerman and um, conversely in road cars, you'd use pro Ackerman. So on road cars where you're generally dealing with slow speeds, obviously the, the inside wheel of the car is traveling a smaller radius than the outside wheel. So you'd want the outside the you'd want the inside wheel to be steering a larger angle um, to get you around there without scrubbing the tire over a gravel drive, that's quite a nice example to use, or um, just generally for prolonged tire life. You, you want a geometrically correct steer angle for each each wheel on an axle. But conversely in racing, where you're dealing with much higher speeds, something comes into play with um, the tyre dynamics, and that is that the slip angle at which a tyre generates its peak grip is varying depending on the load placed on the tyre. So the higher the load, the larger the slip angle at which peak force is generated. So um, yeah, in I guess in my experience, in your experience, Mike, you're you're largely dealing with anti Ackerman. Uh, yeah, that's right. So, uh, as you correctly point out, road cars tend to have more pro Ackerman, uh, and I think the idea here is that you you don't want to be generating a lot of slip on either front tire as you're navigating low speed corners. So, you're absolutely right. Reversing your car onto the drive. Uh, you don't want the uh, either of your tyres to, to be scrubbing a lot laterally across the road surface in that situation. Uh, it's just going gonna, it's, it's gonna to be pretty uncomfortable for, for the driver and, and any passengers in the car. And uh, as you rightly say, you're going to disturb the gravel on your, your gravel drive in that situation. You don't really <laughs> want to be ploughing furrows in, uh, in that surface whilst you're, you're kind of navigating around at low speed. But yeah, a, a race car doesn't have to deal with that condition particularly often, other than maybe leaving the garage at the start of every session. Uh, the, the key here is that you want each tyre to be contributing their full potential 
uh, in in cornering maneuvers uh, you want to maximize the lateral force on the front axle at every point around the lap uh, where you're front limited uh, just to improve your your sort of minimum lap time and, and one of the situations where this this can be particularly crucial is on the way into a corner when your driver is is hard on the brakes uh, if your car has a particularly forward uh, lateral load transfer distribution then your your front inside tire isn't going to have a lot of load on it and if you ask too much of that tire either in terms of lateral demand or longitudinal demand it's just going to lock up and you're going to find yourself not breaking uh, into the corner as, as hard as you'd want to or in the worst situation com completely ruining a set of tires uh, that uh, you you're going to quickly going to need to come into the pits and change so by running a lot of anti ackerman you reduce the lateral demand on that tire in that phase of the corner and it can concentrate more on the braking side might be the the right thing for your car but again it's uh, it's largely situational so to to define uh, anti ackerman angle it's um, you really want to look at where around the track you're going to be benefiting um, the most, right? Because it's not really like a, a one one size fits all kind of thing. You you would define it such that the the slip angles of each tires or, or of each um, inside and outside wheel are optimal for likely a specific um, situation. So perhaps a high speed corner. Um, would be where your focus is there. Yeah, I, th I think you're absolutely right. So when you look at these sorts of things in simulation, anti-Ackerman is, is actually a pretty easy thing to optimize. When you're choosing a value of anti-Ackerman that you want to run on your car, you can have a look at different points around the lap and see the relative vertical load on each tire and what that means for the slip angle at which you'll find peak lateral load uh, and then you can use that to help inform your decision on, on anti-Ackerman level uh, if there's a, a part of the lap that's particularly limiting for you and you want to do all you can to, to get the most out of the front tyres in that situation you might focus on that uh, and you might make other areas of the lap slightly worse or or maybe it brings everything everything together uh, but yeah it's 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 a reasonably, it's one of the, the slightly easier properties to, to optimize in, in the loop. Uh, it, it's not, there's not a, a huge amount of uh, complicated rebalancing that, that you need to worry about. But yeah, the, the idea is, is to get the, the maximum out of the car that's, that's best for you. Uh, it's, it's not like there's a hard and fast rule about the anti ackerman levels uh, each car should be running. Uh, it's something that, that you can be looking at in simulation or, or testing on the track uh, just to get a feel for how this is varying the car's performance. But I, I have to say, it's, it's, don't expect this to change the world. The, the front inside tyre doesn't contribute a great deal to the performance of the car in, in some of these situations. Uh, so nailing this quantity isn't going to get you much further up the grid uh, and it's probably not worth agonizing over too much if you're not uh, completely sure what the uh, the value of Ackerman is on the car you're currently running uh, and you're you know a, a, a long way off the pace let's say I think you can refer back to the the big uh, big five uh, aspects that are going to affect your car performance uh, before uh, you, you know, diving down too far before you get to this quantity. Yeah, and just to reinforce that, I I heard a story um, from a, a European-based F1 team, and um, they were running. They uh, due to some pushing from the aero department, they were running the inside wheel as straight on as possible. Um, you know, so like a really minimal st uh, steer angle from the inside well and I, I think for me that kind of demonstrates how little um, the contribution of the inside wheel is in in some high low transfer situations 
I should add as well, you can go too far in that direction. So for example, it is possible to reverse the slip on the inside tire at really high steer angles. Uh, so it's actually acting to force you out of the corner. Uh, this it's, it's a particularly bad problem in, in a very low speed corner where you're likely to be front limited anyway. Uh, and yeah, this, this anti Ackerman is only going to make that worse, albeit uh, only slightly, because as we said, the, the front inside tends to be pretty unloaded in that condition. By in a plan view, the angle of the steering arm relative to the, lo the longitudinal center line of, of the chassis. Altering your Ackerman angle is just a question of playing around with that angle, right? Yeah, you, you'll often find kinematics textbooks that describe geometries that will arrive at you know perfect 100% pro Ackerman or, or uh, other quantities, but uh, these can tend to be oversimplifications of the problem. And you might find that you're only at 100% for specific points in the steer sweep. Uh, I think my advice it would be always to check in some kinematic software what you're actually achieving rather than relying on uh, the values that, that come purely out of these books to, uh, um, and have 100% confidence that they're doing the right thing. Albeit they're going to put you in, in more or less the right ballpark. And you know, as this isn't going to affect performance too much, if, if you set up your car purely based on uh, you know, rules of from th rules of thumb, I should say, from uh, one of these textbooks, you're not going to be too far away from uh, a, a suitable setup for your car. Yeah, I ran into that um, that issue with uh, defining bump steer once, and in a yeah, I can't remember which textbook it was, but it was you know this is or if you I think it was if you define um, in a front view if you define the the angle of the steering arm to meet the instantaneous center of the other wishbones, then you know you get zero bump steer. But that's not actually the case. So I remember I was chasing my tail a little bit with that. But um, yeah, it's uh, they're good approximations a lot of the time, but in reality, it can be a bit different. Yeah, exactly. Always best to check yourself rather than rely on somebody else's work to tell you what's best for your car. <laughs> yeah, and. Um, so as Ackerman is a tool to play around with slip angles, it can also have some input into your tyre heating. I guess the effect would mostly be on the inside wheel in that sense, but um, how, what's your experience or views on that? I would say it would be pretty rare to choose your, your value of Ackerman to manage tyre temperatures through a stint, but we've, we've already mentioned toe angles and how you can use those to, to make tweaks to your uh, relative tweaks to your Ackerman around the lap uh, as you know the, the situation kind of calls for it. Uh, I think this is something that you might choose to use uh, if you've got a, an issue with heating. I think ad uh, my advice would be in a situation where you're, you're overheating to put the, uh, the tires in a condition that minimizes the uh, the lateral force that you'll see uh, along the straights, uh, as this is probably the point where you're uh, you're doing the least scrubbing, and then uh, you can move away from this position uh, as you want to to heat your tires further. But this is going to this is going to have an impact on you know rolling resistance, uh, how you. Uh, the, the kind of the relative surface and, and bulk temperature of the tire uh, and again it's it's definitely something to test uh, test yourself before going into a a race uh, assuming that one direction or the other is going to uh, put your tires in exactly the right position or the right condition for for your car in that situation Are you, have you ever seen or heard of any situations where someone's got into a bit of trouble with the Ackerman angles and um, yeah, just uh, through the mistakes or just not quite understanding what they're doing. I think it's certainly possible to be 
at a level that's inappropriate for the, the track you're you're using. So as we kind of touched upon already, a lot of anti Ackerman at a circuit with uh, a lot of low speed corners uh, is gonna is probably only gonna add understeer in those conditions. Uh, and and in the worst case, you know the the inside tire is uh, acting against the rest of the car in some of those low speed corners. Uh, so that's probably something to be avoided. But on, on the whole, you know, as I say, this this is quite a uh, small influence over your car performance. Uh, it's not uh, gonna it's not gonna push you too far up the grid if you get this exactly perfect, uh, and it's probably not going to push you too far down the grid if you're you're a long way uh, out of ideal. Uh, but I, I think that's probably less true of of the toe angle. Uh, you can certainly find cars uh, that struggle a lot in particular conditions with uh, with an incorrect toe setting on the car. Uh, and, and also this is a, a dynamic effect. The, the toe angle is going to be varying around the lap and not only through steer, but also through things like uh, compliance effects and, and if there's any bump steer in the suspension. Okay, so I think that was a nice overall summary of Ackerman angles and how they're used and why they're used. So a valuable tool in performance development in racing, but as Mike said, it's not going to take you from the front of the grid or take you from the back of the grid towards the front. It's just another... Um, another piece of the puzzle in creating a you know a balanced and well-performing race car so hope you enjoyed that and we'll be back with another episode and the next one will be focusing on anti-geometry so stay close and that's coming soon